We are attempting our first with new equipment. So wish us luck. Everybody mute their mics or when they're wanting to speak. They come on automatically. Okay. They come on automatically when you speak. Well, that isn't that fancy. No more. Oh, I didn't hit the button. <laughs> okay, 358. For all of those of you in the house, Mike, um, James, and Larry, this is Trent Weiss. He's our forester. And uh, you know Trevor. And Randy, if you can hear us, um, we'll, uh, James will start out with call to order. Does everybody know that? I am ready. Chat's being broadcast. Just so you guys know before we're active here, anything you put in the chat will be broadcast. So as we're all learning, and uh, on the screen I'm using, for those of you at home, I cannot see you. Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. But it looks like we're, we're live, right? Okay, uh, then uh, we'll start with the uh, roll call. Randy. James Hand. Here. Jay Rassier? Here. Larry Selgebold? Here. Janelle Brandon? Here. Lindsay Schoenack? Here. Valerie Ritlin? Here. Sebastian McDougal? Here. And Laura Caroon? Here. All right, thank you, Randy, and thanks everyone for being here, whether in person or virtual. Um, I don't believe tonight uh, on item number two, we have any recognitions, recognitions, presentations, or introductions to be made. There, there is one. Laura is join us, joining us as the alternate as from the city council. Oh, okay. Then, so uh, for some of you who don't know her, welcome, Laura. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Laura. And uh, from there, we will approve the uh, previous meeting minutes that was in your packet. So hopefully you had a chance to review it. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes. This is Lindsay. I'll make the motion to approve the meeting minutes. Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. I don't, uh, we don't really have a citizens addressing the board option tonight, right? Okay, so we, uh, and we didn't receive any, uh, any letters or, or anything to my knowledge, so we will move on to agenda amendments. Does anyone have any amendments to the agenda? Okay. And we will move right to item number six. Uh, Trent Weiss is gonna talk to us about the MB Johnson food forest. This on, can you hear me? Yeah, well, there we go, all right. My name is Trent Wise. Uh, I'm Moorhead City Forester. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, food forest at MB Johnson Park. Um, so in this presentation, we will talk about uh, how the project came to be, uh, the project itself, um, what a food forest is, uh, location of the food forest, some of the maintenance aspects, uh, some benefits, uh, potential for events, 
and um, a, a survey results of a survey that we put out. Um, so how the project came to be. Uh, this is a pilot project developed by the Resilience Task Force, um, who has a goal of developing long-term community-based and proactive responses to climate change in order to reduce vulnerability and reinforce the strengths of people, infrastructure, and institutions. Uh, there were 19 local organizations represented on this task force. <clears throat> uh, some of those are the City of Moorhead, Clay County, Concordia, MSUM, River Keepers, uh, as well as others. Um, this, this project was proposed by the Ecosystems Work Group. Uh, it meets all three of their criteria of biodiversity, land use, man, land use and management, and river water quality and quantity. The main question we had um, once we found out we were going to be able to do a project in the community was uh, how do we enhance our ecosystem to create a more resilient moorhead? Uh, there were several suggestions, uh, but ultimately we chose the food forest as the project we thought uh, would have a significant impact in the community. Uh, so the project itself, um, it is a, a food forest composed of trees and shrubs planted at MB Johnson Park. Uh, this food forest would be open to the public for enjoyment year round, including harvest. Uh, we would install all the plants as an Arbor Day project involving Moorhead residents. Um, we have started planning this event and um, we have a tentative date of May 13th. Uh, main uh, this, this food forest would be maintained by Moorhead Public Works uh, and possibly volunteer groups. Uh, the tree care would be done by Moorhead Forestry and uh, turf maintenance or turf would be maintained by uh, park maintenance. Um, I also want to point out that this project is funded um, through a Bush grant that was um, obtained through the Resilience Task Force. What is a food forest? A food forest is a diverse mixture of edible plants that once established will produce food. Um, it's also called a forest garden, an edible forest, or most commonly an orchard. Um, it is public food in a public space, and we will be planting a variety of plants, um, apples, pears, plums. Uh, we weren't able to purchase apricots, um, but service berries, honey berries, and aronia berries as well. Um, we are still looking into possibly um, getting some hazelnuts, um, but if if we do have future plantings, gooseberries, mulberries, um, chestnuts, and other plants would be would be possible to plant out there. Um, so we chose MB Johnson um, because it has a, a large vacant area <clears throat> um, for this volume of plants, 140 plants that we're looking at installing, uh, we needed a large area. Um, the, the apple trees, the, the trees will be planted 25 feet minimum from each other for, um, for growing purposes as they mature and fill out. Um, they will need that space, but also for maintenance purposes. Um, so we needed that large area, but we also wanted a place that was uh, at a higher elevation. This area, I believe is 38 or 39 feet, so there weren't there won't be any annual flooding of uh, these trees. Um, there's also many amenities at Johnson Park, uh, hiking and biking <clears throat> trails, boat launch, playground. Um, there's snowshoeing, skiing. Um, there's also facilities with water and restrooms. Uh, we thought this would enhance the park, and there would be more uh, opportunities for people when they visit the park. Um, and the appeal of facilities with water and restrooms is also was also one of the reasons um, for for the potential to host events in the future. So here is the proposed food forest. Um, as you drive into the park, it is right off of your first parking lot, or right off right off the street, right off the entrance in the first parking lot. Um, the bike path also loops around the south side of where the, the food forest will be, so there's good accessibility. Um, this design has been altered um, since I set up this PowerPoint. I actually changed it up today. So 
Uh, I'm looking at um, putting a, a path through the middle for even more accessibility. Uh, I don't know if that path will be a grass path, mulch, or or any other, uh, maybe crushed concrete. Um, but that is something we're looking at as well. And then um, each tree you can see in the the, the image uh, next to the the layout. Um, each tree will have uh, four posts put around it with a four four foot high uh, fence uh, for deer protection. We'll also use a tree guard around each tree and wire mesh um, for vole protection. So maintenance of the food forest. Um, this will be more of a natural area. <clears throat> There'll be minimal maintenance um, required with reduced mowing. Um, we anticipate uh, we would mow every other normal mowing that park maintenance currently does. Uh, I believe they have it on a 10 day rotation. So we would mow it every 20 days. Uh, we would see how that goes and possibly move it out to every 30 days. And um, we plan to prune the trees on a three year rotation for the first 15 to 20 years. This would ensure proper branching structure to maintain the tree in the landscape for as long as possible. The benefits of the food forest would be open access for all community members to gather healthy foods. Um, it would enhance the appeal of MB Johnson Park, hopefully leading to greater usage of the park. Um, community involvement, educational opportunities, promoting the outdoors. Um, like I, I said there in that little bullet, it's ideal for photographs. Uh, I think that's one thing that people might not um, quite understand is that this, this image here is of um, Orchard Glen in Moorhead, or sorry, in Fargo. I used to work for the Fargo Park District. And in the spring, um, we would get just as many users um, just going to look at the trees as they're in blossom and take photographs. And they'll it'll also provide pollinators with um, lots of habitat or food potential. There's also um, the possibility for future events. As I mentioned, we we're planning on doing Arbor Day there this year. Um, there's the potential for fruit tree pruning and best management practice workshops, which would be a great resource for community members seeking to better understand how to prune and care for fruit trees. Um, there's also the possibility for future additions um, with MB Johnson being such a large space, if this is a success and we, we want to expand, there is room for expansion up there. Um, there's also possibilities for future parks and rec events once trees are large enough to produce fruit. So the ecosystems work group um, conducted a survey um, to gather community input, engage interest. Uh, we asked four questions. Um, we got around 330 or 340 responses. Um, the first question we asked, do you support a community orchard? Uh, I think there were only 10 people that said that they were neutral, somewhat opposed, or strongly opposed. So we had um, over 300 people that strongly supported or somewhat supported. Um, we asked what people thought potential benefits of the orchard would be. Um, pollinator habitat was number one, followed by a source of local food. And many people thought um, community involvement and increased visual interest was also a benefit of the orchard. We asked people if they would use the orchard. Uh, just over 300 said they would, and um, around 30 people thought that they, they probably would not. Um, we also had 44 comments, additional comments of support, 20 comments expressing concern. Um, those comments were were mostly um, based off of uh, the concern um, with wildlife in that area, since it is along the river corridor, um, how they would impact the trees. And then also how the orchard would be, the other concern was how the orchard would be maintained. Um, we had 32 other miscellaneous comments. Nine of those comments were um, additional plant varieties Two comments were for volunteer ideas, 13 comments for additional locations to plant, uh, to do 
um, orchard or edible forests um, throughout town, and then uh, just nine other miscellaneous comments as well. Um, that is what I have for you. Um, with that, I will open it up for any questions. Uh, thank you, Trent, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I have uh, a couple questions, and then if anyone on uh, WebEx or anyone else in the room has questions, feel free to to throw them out there. Uh, and maybe I missed this, but when uh, is the anticipated like ready for fruit day? When the public would yeah. have, or day or year? Excuse me, is it are we like five years out? Are we ten yeah. years? Or how does that? So we got a variety of fruit tree variety of fruit trees and we also got a variety of rootstock so we we purchased some trees that had dwarf rootstock so those trees could bear fruit as soon as three years um but i would anticipate them taking five to six years before you could get a decent amount of fruit off of them um and then we also purchased trees that are um, just standard rootstock and those trees will probably take seven to 10 years, but they'll be longer lived in the landscape than the semi-dwarf rootstock. And then the, the berries could produce with, within two years. And how, like to what kind of scale as far as, you know, like how many families could realistically go and pick a barrel of, of apples or, red, yeah. you know, in the, are we in the hundreds or thousands or? I'm not really sure. Um, that's going to depend on the the maturity of the trees, and that's also going to depend on the user. I mean, if people um, abuse it and you know go fill up their truck, <laughs> you know that's going to take away from other opportunities. So I I guess I don't have a great answer for that. And that's one. and that's totally fine. How was did you did you when you were working with? Fargo, did you deal with, did you have a lot of those issues where people abuse the, you know, the um, system or was it pretty well? You know, not that I'm aware of. Um, I think, I mean, I think some people would take advantage of it, but um, from my experience, um, if you wanted to go out there and pick a pail of apples, you still had the option to do that. I mean, that was, there was still that opportunity there. And then my... One of my thoughts was, you know, I've been to that orchard in Fargo and, and, you know, where this is probably 10, 20 years down the road of an issue is some of the bigger trees, you know, you can't reach the, the yep. fruit. So you get a lot of trees that end up top heavy and they kind of shape, I assume that's all at least somewhat in the thought of, you know, when it comes to maintenance and all that, uh, you know, long term that it'll, that yeah. um, there's something in place there. How does yeah, it so so one of the things to address that is that semi-dwarf rootstock that also limits the size of the tree. So those trees will be roughly 15 to 20 feet tall and 15 feet wide. Uh, so, so that should help. Um, but the other trees, I mean, we could, we can prune them so that we don't have those issues. Um, but I think there will, there will always be some trees that have those issues where they have fruit that's, that's hard to reach. And where did the funding for this program come from? Uh, it was a, a Bush fund, um, and that was procured by the Resilience Task Force. Um, beyond that, I guess I'm not really. That's yeah. That's helpful. Does anyone on uh, Does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. This is Valerie, and I'm assuming the watering is coming from the river. And then um, what did you learn from the North Fargo and South Fargo um, orchards that, you know, was helpful in planning this particular orchard? Yeah, the, the watering will be done. Um, we'll, we'll water once a week. Um, we have a water truck that goes around town and waters all, our, all the trees we plant um, for two years. So these trees will be on a two year possibly three year um, cycle, we'll water them once a week. Um, and then, you know, so I guess what we've learned from some of the Fargo um, orchards or edible forests, um, you know, my time spent with the Fargo Park District, um, we, we installed 100 fruit trees as part of an Arbor Day. And um, so 
I learned proper way to um, protect those trees from animals. Um, Cause again, that was in an area that was um, heavily wooded along the river corridor. And then we, we met with um, Jim Walla who organized the um, Botanical Society Edible Forest in North Fargo. And um, he had a lot of good points um, also about bull protection and maintaining the turf. Um, I guess that has been one of my biggest concerns is making sure that we don't have that animal damage. And uh, so that's that's also one of the biggest takeaways from what we've learned with working with those um, those groups. Anyone else on uh, WebEx have any questions? Right. Well, Trent, thanks I a lot. I do have oh, wait, one more on. thing to add. Um, one of the comments that we've re received quite a bit of in the survey, and then I gave this presentation to city council maybe three three weeks ago, and then there was also an article in the, the forum uh, on Saturday. One of the things we've heard a lot of is um, people talking about more centrally located, smaller edible forests. Um, that is something we're looking into. Um, we want to do this initial installation of this larger food forest and then possibly do some of those smaller, um, more neighborhood orchards in the future. And we think that would be an excellent way to, to continue um, to have that community involvement and interest while these plants grow um, to where they're big enough to where they can produce, produce fruit. Very All right. cool. Thank yeah. you. No, thank you very much. And I think I mispronounced your last name when I introduced you, so I apologize for that. No problem. Trent Wise, everyone remember that. <laughs> um, cool. Well, thanks again. We appreciate it. And it's a really cool project. Looking forward to uh, bringing the kids out there as the you know everything starts to grow and bloom. And so I think it's really cool for the city. So thank you. Uh, up next, we'll go to item seven, which is an update on community projects. Holly, you want to... I certainly can take that one. Um, we have a couple, uh, five community initiatives that we've been working on as per the strategic plan for the city council. One of them is the Southside Dog Park. And as you guys know, um, we've put the fencing around that and have gotten a great start. Mike is here, um, we've got fencing, we've got a few amenities out there. Um, he added some solar lighting, uh, that close proximity to the river, as all knows, we can't bring in utilities such as water and so forth down to there. So the, we're trying some solar lighting out there. Um, the other thing about Southside Dog Park is we continue to raise funds and we have about $2,500 from um, Christmas, uh, the community catalog for the FM Area Foundation and some Christmas donations towards the dog park. As we get those, we'll spend those quarterly um, so we are currently purchasing some new amenities for out there. Um, the other thing is, is that um, last year we wrote the AARP challenge grant. Um, we are hoping to resubmit that now that we have the fencing up and so forth. We submitted the grant and was denied for early 2020, um, but we're gonna resubmit that um, for consideration now that we have more in-kind money and, and more that it is built. So we look forward to that. The next project was always a community center and it was previously the aquatic center. Um, this project changed as we were denied funding last year by the legislature in the bonding bill because um, this is a project that we had hoped to go to the vote for a sales tax. Um, basically, they felt like the community center part and the aquatics was not as much of a regional draw. And uh, the committee in the state leans towards needing, if you're gonna charge a sales tax, the region helps pay for that. So the new commitment that they voted on in December was for a community center and a library. So that is the new project that's being proposed to the legislature for consideration. Um, the inclusive playground, we just had an interview today um, with WDAY. We have some new project champions on board for that committee. 
Um, they've had a couple visits um, with community trying to raise the funds necessary for the inclusive playground. We had an interview with WDAY right before this meeting um, that I thought went very well. And so we'll hope to get some exposure and continue to raise money. We're at about uh, $100,000 raised for that project. A lot of that money came um, from some city money that we had um, for to put a playground out in that area for a new development. So there, there was able to jump to that $100,000. We've identified about five or six grants we think are very possible towards that project, but we need to raise more of a match before we can um, write for those grants. Um, the grants also many times require that you, you're in the ground within a year and building it within a year of receiving. So with a million dollar price tag on that project, having $100,000, we're not ready to go in the ground yet, but we're hoping to spur additional, um, additional fundraising towards that project. We've added some opportunities for the inclusive playground. That would be a lower sum donation possibility, um, fence line, pickets with your name on the pickets. We, Wilmer did this, I've talked to them and they've given us permission to use some of their, um, to use their marketing strategies and to uh, kind of borrow their idea for ours here. Um, and so we're looking at those would be a hundred dollars a piece and then benches and so forth. All of the lower dollar items are needed also. So anybody that could contribute towards an inclusive playground, it would be appreciated. It's on our website and also on the FM Area Foundation. Uh, Nature Playground and Bike Skills Park. Um, that group is, uh, that's a project spearheaded by the Fargo-Moorhead Rotary Clubs. Uh, their foundation and that is moving along nicely. Um, they were hoping to uh, unveil kind of their blueprint and their plans at this meeting, but they're not quite ready to be unveiled yet. And then they will start their major fundraising campaign for the FM Rotary for a natural playground. At this point, it's slated to go up on Riverfront Park, up where the old tennis center was um, that was recently taken down. So that would be a year round um, nature playground. Um, we've been doing some work with um, redoing some of our flyers and our fundraisers for the dog park and inclusive. Um, other projects are also the mats and grandstand that uh, remains out there a bit and also to, uh, field lighting for out at Southside Regional Park, but those don't have the project champions. We're hoping to finish a couple of these first and um, five, six or whatever is a lot to focus on. So um, we continue to work with our committees on all of those. So does anybody have questions on um, on these projects? Holly, this is Val, and I have a question on the um, the regional library and community center. Is that I did read all the information, and and so I thought I understood it, but then I got a little confused. Is that one building? Yes, one building, and I know it said that there wasn't any decisions or ideas about location, but are there some at least options that you're thinking about as far as the site for that? You know that, that uh, right now there is a study that's ongoing, a needs assessment for the library. You'll see some focus groups coming up. Um, I think they're looking at a couple locations. The existing site for the library, I think, is one of those where they might, uh, with some additional parking. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with the details of that plan. Um, also, needs assessment for what the community center would look like onto onto that. It could have some athletics. Um, they've always talked about senior center and some other things, but I don't know until the community has been asked what those um, items would look like. So um, in, in no matter where they put it, do you see the library being torn down or reused? Um, the reason that the library comes to the top of a priority list is because the library is in very poor condition. 
um, structurally and so forth. Um, you know, I don't know, Mike, if you have any other information on that, but I think they look to raise the library. Thank you. Holly, this is Lindsay. I just have a quick question. When we talk about doing the um, community asks for the needs of the community center specifically, what will that look like when we get to that point? I am hoping that we will um, be able to use a consultant to look at what those questions may be and do some focus groups um, to really do some uh, survey to the, our community. So I'm not, um, it's kind of at the beginning stage. The library is in the first stages of what they need as a library and asking folks and assembling um, uh, focus groups and um, assembling some needs information. The community center part, we're not that far enough along yet. Thanks, Holly. Um, I wanted to mention that I took a survey that the library sent. So I just happened to see the Lake Agassiz Regional Library Facebook page offered up a needs assessment uh, from the consulting firm that they're working with out of St. Paul. So it did ask some of those uh, questions regarding to needs, community needs, library related. I don't remember as many associated with community center um, but it was probably a 10 minute survey monkey. If I can find the link, I'll share it in the chat box. Um, but that was library generated, not city generated. Yeah, the, Thanks. um, if, if I could share too, the, um, community center part has not yet, um, been out. So. Okay. All right. We'll, um, if there are no other questions on the community projects update, update, we'll go to uh, Trevor, who is going to uh, give us a presentation on programming during the pandemic. Take it away, Trevor. So, yeah, we're here to talk about a few things our uh, Parks and Rec Department's been up to um, over the past several months, specifically um, in regards to winter, a lot of winter outdoor activation. Um, things that we, you know, spoke briefly on in November, but just wanting to kind of give you guys an update on where we're at. So um, we'll get started here with um, our outdoor skating rinks. We did get open um, a little later just because of the warm weather we had in December. Um, they were all up and running by January 6th, and then the warming houses um, were able to be opened on January 11th. That was just due to some COVID restrictions that were in place by the state. Um, on, they kind of had those shut down as part of um, their stay, stay, stay safe plan for a little while. So we got those opens and we've seen really good use out of those um, throughout the year. I know our park maintenance team put out benches at all of those um, rinks and uh, we saw a lot of just heavy use of the, just the kids putting on their um, skates and things on those and that sounds like a plan to kind of continue throughout this looks to be the the last week um of it was our last week here closing down on february 28th for those um we had plans to extend it if weather allows but with this kind of warm streak it looks like it'll probably be um the end of that uh as far as special events goes frostable has been going on hopefully you all have kind of heard Heard about that over the last couple months. Um, we're going to be giving a little presentation on here shortly. Just wanted to kind of touch base on a few of our other things before we really dive deeper into that. Uh, our cross-country ski and snowshoe rentals. Uh, we moved down to the Yumcom Center this year. Been an awesome success for us. Um, we did get some new grooming equipment that park maintenance um, has been working with. And even just around the city, we now have 15 miles of groom trails around seven different parks um, and kind of getting an update from Jordan um, in your packet here on the memo, memo you'll see we did. We had done about $2,400 um, as of 216 in rental sales last weekend. We brought in an additional 650. So that number is over 3000, which um, in past years, it's about $1,000. So that program really has taken off um, for us this winter. 
Um, we also partnered with Nature of the North on a number of different activities. Uh, most popular were some snowshoe excursions that we kind of tied in with that rental program. So on three separate Wednesday nights, we had 15 people register, um, which was kind of the maximum that we allowed to kind of allow for that safe social distancing. Uh, and they uh, helped kind of coordinate some leaders that took them just around the trails and spoke on different topics. Uh, one of them was about wildlife around the Red River. Uh, we had a history of the Red um, along the trails and then kind of a um, peacefulness, just kind of getting connected with nature topic that was led to. So those have been um, received pretty well this winter. A uh, few other things, just as far as the programming goes, we are continuing with just our digital brochure right now. Uh, COVID has still affected a lot of our events and activities as far as the numbers that we're allowing um, in certain, um, like our swimming lessons and things like that, where things might change. Uh, last year when we got hit originally, our spring brochure that we printed nearly 20,000 copies of, all that information was just inaccurate once uh, we had so many cancellations and adjustments. So as of now, we'll continue to just print uh, or just to have that digital option so we can make those updates available. And we're talking about internally better ways that we can get that digital brochure in the hands of the residents so they are aware when programs are available to be registered for it and whatnot. Uh, as the summer as park programs, we're gonna try to get back to as near as possible um, with all our numbers from previous years. But again, we'll just kind of follow whatever guidelines are in place uh, and that'll go with our pools and swimming lessons. Uh, we'll plan to reopen with whatever uh, guidelines the state has set out for us. So kind of without um, any more updates there, we'll kind of jump into this Frostville presentation and um, this is this was a great year for Frostable. I think across all the communities, what we were looking to do is really get people outdoors, uh, get people to enjoy enjoy winter. And, and a couple things made that a little easier. People were itching for things to do, and we had a pretty nice winter as far as the weather go. We'll we'll get into a few events over the last few weeks that had to get canceled because of some exp extreme cold. But this was the sixth annual Frostable event, um, originally organized by the Fargo Moorhead CVB and um, the, Far the Fargo Park, West Fargo Park and our parks departments here kind of um, helped push it along over the last few years. In 2020 was the first year where this was actually extended over multiple weeks. Um, originally, it was kind of just a two day uh, event for the first four years. Um, and a lot of comments that were received back was, hey, we can't get to all these events. We want more to do. It's, it's cold in Fargo Moorhead more than just two days. So it, we made the decision to push it to a kind of a two month long celebration of winter. And I think it's been received very positively. You'll see here that um, there was over 40 events planned um, throughout the Fargo Moorhead, West Fargo communities. And of those 18 were actually scheduled to be in Moorhead. So um, our parks department worked closely with the Moorhead Business Association and a lot of their members on planning these events. And uh, we got a really good buy-in from that. And that's something we're already looking forward to next year. Uh, we have our next um, kind of our first 2022 planning meeting Thursday. So, you know, we finish up and we're getting right back to it. So to give a kind of a little bit of a summary on the events that we had um in moorhead things kind of got kicked off on friday january 29th and at moorhead billiards uh the mba kind of hosted just a, a kickoff party there for um for the community and it sounded like they did some drawings um they gave out a the the billiards cape gave out a pool stick to a lucky winner there and it, that was an event originally planned for heralds um but with their kind of limited size and capacity they just thought it would be best to kind of take the year off. They had an awesome uh, first event in 2020 and they're hoping to be involved again next year. The Frozen Fortress for us was probably our biggest and most uh, attended event um, that our parks department was involved with. And there we did free ski and snowshoe rentals. Um, that event went from 11 to three and we had 126 people rent our equipment that day. So that was an awesome turnout for that. Some other uh, activities we had, there was a snowshoe hike uh, led by river keepers. We did snoga 
just yoga in the snow and then a dance attack um like she got a lot of people just kind of moving around we had an awesome day it was probably 25 30 degrees no wind uh so there's a lot of people out there enjoying it we gave away s'mores to the people um some of the guests there when we had 250 kind of s'mores packs that were donated by the lead networking group and a lot of these events um we had great volunteers for davies um, high school their key club had about 10 volunteers for us there throughout that day and they just kind of helped monitor some of the activities we had going on making sure people were um you know the kids were taking turns on our snow slide um and different things like that <clears throat> excuse me uh the frostable snow sculpture competition put on by the moorhead business association was an awesome awesome turnout this year uh, as on the screen it was our, featured as a photos of our five master artists uh, they did have one other community artist and then after after the comp uh, competition uh, kicked off a few of these artists took uh, some chainsaws to a few of the other blocks that were left free to make some just additional sculptures out there that weren't part of the judging but uh, the one on the left pegasus here a part of the the new day uh, which was sculpted by Jay Ray, who's been participated in this competition each year. He won both the People's Choice Award and the judges' vote for that. Um, but that was a, uh, you know, once those got built that week after we had online voting, uh, there was the park was busy. I'm sure Holly can attest with it being down at the Umcom Center here that each you would go out to the parking lot, there's people walking around. We had um, sleds for the sledding hill just laid out for people to use. Um, and the park as a whole had a lot of general use, um, even when there wasn't events going on. So from what you just saw, these are, these are kind of just a picture of how those, how those cubes started off. I think it's just incredible the amount of work these artists put in over that week, um, starting with a, a snow cube that's filled up by our park maintenance team, um, which you'll see kind of in a, another attachment in your packet is a kind of a little update on some of those things that they've been involved with. Um, I mentioned the groomed trails and the new equipment we had. They remodeled one of the warming houses, but even just at our special events, the amount of work that they put in um, and just being really responsive and being kind of available on the queue to get something done for us. Uh, none of these events could happen without them. So Mike, I wanna thank you and your guys' team for um, really helping out this winter with all of our activities. And moving on into the week, a new event that we hosted was our candlelight trail walk um, featuring Mary's Tunnel, which I know all of us have had the opportunity to see um, the amount of community comments that we've had on that. Uh, basically, what we did is we lined our walking path with some luminaries and let them right into Mary's Tunnel. And then out the out the back end, we had just some yard games uh, we roasted s'mores hot dogs and being that this was a first time event didn't really know what to expect um, we started at about five o'clock which was still a little too too early for those luminaries to really show so some you know notes that were made for next year but um as soon as it got a little bit darker the family started coming and it was just kind of overwhelming like wow this was perceived a lot better than i had thought and we gave about we gave away another 250 s'mores and about 140 hot dogs that day. Um, so that turned out to be an awesome, awesome event for us there. We had ski rentals there. Um, Nature of the North was helping demonstrate some equipment that day. Um, kind of the one update about this event though, being that it was new, the uh, reason we were able to host this was just kind of some extra funds that were available from um, some events not being able or not being run last year. So as we kind of look towards uh, the future and being able to expand Frostable and all of our event offerings, there's gonna be some budget things we'll have to look at to make sure we can still provide some of these cool events. Uh, as I mentioned, the MBA uh, kind of took on, has taken on a big role in the programming of Frostable the last two years. They really get a buy-in from a lot of their members. You'll see here, um, they had a lot of events over at the, the American Legion, uh, specifically on one of those frigid weekends, uh, February 6th, they did a Nature of the North hosted a outdoor gear garage sale. 
uh, they had a bonfire building workshop and then a, a big bonfire um, that night at the Legion. The Nature of the North also worked with the Scott Tobalt Foundation on a free open skate at the Colin Hockey Center. And then the FM Legion riders did a freezing for a good reason um, event, which was kind of a um, event geared towards just awareness of the homelessness amongst veterans um, and this kind of suicide prevention amongst them. And they raised uh, a ton of money, which um, I know I think here in the last slide, I have a that, that update there on that amount, but that turned out to be a really well perceived event as well. We also kicked off our Adopt the Hydrant Volunteer Program. So then Council Member uh, Carlson, now Mayor, Mayor Carlson, uh, brought this kind of idea to us. West Fargo has something in place already, and we worked closely with her, Moorhead Public Service, and uh, the Moorhead Fire Department to kind of get, get this kicked off the ground. We opened up a application that people can go right in, um, kind of a link on their phone or their desktop, sign up, adopt their neighborhood hydrant. And if they signed up during our frostival period, they got um, put in for a drawing for a prize pack sponsored by Signature Home Technologies. So uh, our winner here is pictured with uh, Chief Dyson and Mayor Carlson. And that is, that is actually gonna be a year round opportunity now. We'll kind of include it with all of our other volunteer um, information to kind of get that, um, kind of help push that and help the fire department go. And I think it fits really well into our Frostable theme. You know, we want to get people outdoors and active. And, you know, this year we didn't have as much snow as um, planned, but you adopted a hydrant, you might have some work to do in the morning. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's just a list of what was planned in Moorhead um, and just kind of a brief update in addition to what I just kind of shared. Um, so that frost will kick off at Billiards. They had about 40 people attend for that. Um, our Frozen Fortress, as I mentioned, very well attended. Our, our disc golf tournament at Woodlawn Park had 66 participants this year. Um, give cards to the winners of that. Uh, we worked closely with the disc golf club to run that. Uh, we actually had sleigh rides during Frostable this year. Uh, basically, a, another event that we would have hosted in December that kind of got pushed back because of COVID, but we sold out of tickets for that event. We actually moved it to MB Johnson. Um, typically, it's been around uh, Viking Ship Park the last couple of years, but MB is, uh, I think, a great park that is a little may maybe unknown to some people. You know, we just heard from Trent and trying to get more people out there to uh, kind of experience that in the scenes that are out there. Uh, so yeah, that reason for a good reason, they had over $10,000 worth of donations and then truckloads of food and clothing. So awesome, awesome turnout from the community helping out with that. Um, but you will see a couple events on here that were canceled. So our kickball event, um, we had to cancel. Our, we had a broom ball event scheduled for uh, February 13th and we had some extremely cold temperatures there that we had to uh, cancel that. And then one of MBA's members, EHP Performance, was going to be doing a family-friendly event at their facility that canceled. But all, all people that are looking forward to, you know, participating again in 2022, I know there was a number of other events that were talked about that just, you know, weren't quite ready with the, with the year we were having. Um, but it should be, you know, it, Frostable as a whole throughout all three communities is something that's going to be, um, I think, expanding in the future. Uh, and again, I just wanted to kind of thank everyone that helped out um, amongst Moorhead um, specifically. Uh, so you can kind of see the list of um, those people that helped specifically with our events. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Moorhead Business Association had a number of other businesses that were involved with a lot of their things. And uh, again, we're just looking for ways to expand that and get more activities for uh, the community in the future and get them outside in the winter. So. If anyone has any questions about what we did or comments on, you know, if they were out at uh, any of the events and some things that they saw, but um, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thanks a lot, Trevor. I um, um, really appreciate the work that, that the, the department has done uh, embracing Frostable, Frostable, and uh, we attended several events that were were great. The, the Luminary Night was really cool. 
uh, even though it was really cold as well. <laughs> um, but I thought that was fantastic. And I can say from the MBA perspective as well as a board member of that organization that we really appreciate the partnership with Parks. And uh, that has been um, just something that our members get really excited about. And it's been a really neat way to engage the community when most people are, you know, huddling inside and not uh, engaging anymore, especially this year. So um, just kudos to the whole group on that. It's been, a, a, I think, a huge success this year. Um, and um, with that, any other questions or comments uh, on online? Looks like I see, I see at least one nodding head. Yeah. <laughs> All right. uh, you, James, you took the words right out of my mouth. The Frostival events have just been incredible. Uh, we had the opp opportunity to head over the weekend that we did the competition with the snow sculpting and, and our kids got to rent some cross country skis and just had so much fun uh, in a non threatening you know, way to be able to, to get out on some skis. But the reason I um, unmuted, I wanted to ask a question, um, Trevor, you had mentioned before about that we're not mailing booklets, which I totally appreciate, you know, from an environmental perspective and from an outdated information perspective. Are we doing anything on a smaller scale, such as, you know, a one sheeter? I'm thinking of my in-laws who always um, book our kids golf lessons every year. And without that visual prompt in the mailbox, um, our our seniors or individuals who aren't as prone to being online to see that digital catalog are we getting anything in their mailboxes even if it's a one pager um saying you know come find our digital catalog online sure uh you know right now we haven't um done a piece like that but we we have taken comments from individuals looking for that piece in the mail and it's um, something you know we've noted and are you know aware of that hey this is going to be something that would be useful people do look for it they are conditioned to look for that piece in the mailbox in that piece in the mailbox you know that first part of february that first part of august so uh we're, we're having internal conversations uh amongst our staff on best ways to get that out you know we've talked about you know in the future using our registration software to send out um for all those people that have registered that data, that big database of emails that we now have, getting them the piece directly to their email address. And instead of just, pull, you know, what we've done um, at the beginning of February when our spring and summer brochure went out is we posted on Facebook and we used our, you know, city e-notification. But yeah, definitely looking for more ways that we can get um, the message out to as many people as we can. I would just like to add, uh... Congratulations on all the success of all those activities. And amongst the people that I hang out with, I can say that the, the snow sculptures and Mary's Tunnel were just so, so popular with our community um, and had so many comments about how much fun they had. And so that was a lot of things that you were able to still put in place in spite of the COVID in spite of the weather, the snow, snow or too cold or whatever. Wow, that's a lot. And uh, thank you for that work. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I echo what um, the other park board members have shared. And I did want to offer up an observation as well in terms of the um, cross country ski and park trail usage as an avid user of both so uh utilizing the cross-country ski trails for me my route is to start at the bergquist cap um and make my way to, you know two miles out and then back up so that takes me underneath the uh, kayak rental area a little bit beyond and then turn around and come back and i actually did ski the day of your uh free snowshoe and ski rental which was a character builder in um you know learning the ropes of the trail with <laughs> new users so it was lovely uh to watch watch that occur across the entire age spectrum little tiny 18 month olds on up to seniors out there on skis and snowshoes now i will say outside of those special events 
as a runner and a walker on our Moorhead City Trails, I'm sad to report that as a trail user, I have been forced um, to go to Fargo. Can you believe it? On the trail system because there are disruptions in the maintenance pattern of the connected Moorhead Trail system. So I noticed that with the inclusion of the um, cross country ski trails, I didn't realize that that would also mean that perhaps it's a reroute of um, maintenance patterns. So the Bergquist cabin trail where the trailhead starts up there continues to be snow removed cleared. But I did notice that um, on foot, you know, throughout, I'm not able to there. I don't believe that there's trail clearing going on in a connected fashion all the way through that leads underneath as it has been uh, repurposed back up into the cross country ski trail. So whomever is kind of in charge of that piece, if they could just help me understand um, so I can share that with our, you know, other pedestrian population throughout the season. Well, I can answer some of that. I know that um, there's areas that are, are no longer cleared to allow for the cross country ski trails, no longer cleared by um, those paths or double used for the cross country. Some of it is because of width. Um, we have a skate ski trail and we also have a classic trail. And so there's areas that both a walking trail and then those two trails are not able to get through. So there are less um, pedestrian trails in the winter. Um, it's something that we're going to be looking at. We're going to map out um, to allow other people to look at that. But you're correct. They are, are not as available in the winter as they are in the summer in regards to pedestrian walking. Yeah, thank you for that. Just that addressing and and the reason I say that is definitely from a place of inclusivity, not because it's fine. I will definitely run over the bridge and go to Fargo for my um, my neighbors and friends across the river. I just want to make sure that those that are uh, moving about COVID winter and and beyond can stay connected and not get bumped due to, um, you know, whether they're trying to get to the library or get to the downtown areas. And and I just found myself as a user in several instances where I, you know, it just basically came to a stop where I'd be trudging through deeper snow, et cetera. Um, and kind of a little confused too, like I knew there was a trail here, it's just, you know, it's snow covered. Now, on the other hand, this is a low snow season, which has been great. Um, for those that enjoy the the park trails and the system connected system. Um, and there has been another feedback comment from me. A lot of trail maintenance this year, which I so appreciate. I'm going to add kind of on, on to that is that um, getting 15 more or 11 more miles of skiing. There has to be a little education there too, because. I mean, I remember coming to a meeting at the MCOMS here and thinking, well, here's a person outdoors. And then I see them walking on the cross country ski trail. And there's a lot of people just, they don't mean harm, they just don't know. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, signage or something to say, this is skiing, this is, you know, something else that I think would go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think Jordan from our staff, who's kind of handled that program, has kind of helped, you know, worked with, uh, the ski groups in town to try to see, you know, build that awareness and kind of pull some signage and, um, but yeah, there's always more that, you know, more education, more things that you can try to push out and um, in different avenues to reach as many people that are using those trails. If it was a cooperative thing between the two cities, Fargo Market, because you both have cross country ski trails right along the river. And it's like, if you see a sign over there, you'll carry, you know, you carry that knowledge over here. You see it here, you'll carry it over there. And it's just, you know, it, when you're skiing along and all of a sudden it's all broken mm -hmm. up by somebody who just doesn't know any better, you can't, you know, just a little education would help, I think. But they were great, I'll tell you that, they were great. Uh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of hours put in by Mike's crew for sure. Mike, maybe you can mention about the new signs that we're working on that are the same as Fargo's. 
Yes, uh, we'll be uh, hopefully making them here soon. Uh, some signs to be put out to the trails to uh, let people know, like you said, they, they don't know any better walking across these ski trails and hopefully that'll, uh, that'll help uh, us with all of our uh, troubles we're having with the skiers and the walkers because they both like to be outside in the wintertime too. So hopefully we get those up. I don't know if we'll get them up this year, but we'll try and for, for sure for next year. And then to Janelle's point, we will um, try to do continuous walking trails. I know that there's some by Burquist on the frontage road area there, but we'll try and map that and let people know the differences. Um, just that, you know, in the end of November is kind of when we were funded to do this and it kind of exploded on us. So we'll catch up. Awesome, any, uh, <clears throat> any other discussion? Right. With that, thanks again, Trevor. Appreciate the update and the info. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a Moorhead comprehensive plan update from uh, Forrest, the assistant city planner. And I believe you're coming to us from WebEx, right? Yeah, I think I see you. Yep, I'm on WebEx. Cool. Awesome. So thanks for having me all today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And I just wanted to give you a brief update of how our uh, comprehensive plan update is going. Um, so just a little brief overview of what a comprehensive plan is. It's a long range document that kind of helps shape how the city will grow over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and it provides frameworks for how uh, city leaders, developers, business owners, and citizens can get involved to help with um, bringing those elements of the comprehensive plan to life. Um, and generally these plans are uh, updated every 10 to 15 years just because of how fast communities grow. Um, the last time our comprehensive plan was updated um, was in 2004 and it actually had a minor update in 2009. Um, so from 2004 to now it's been, uh, was that 17 years? Um, and from 2009 to now it's been 11 years. So definitely time for an update. Um, we estimate that this process is gonna take about 18 months to do um, just because we have to go out and get feedback from um, the community, and then we have to analyze all the different uh, components uh, uh, part of it as well. Um, our comprehensive plan is gonna focus on several different aspects, um, including land use, housing, business and jobs, uh, parks and open space, transportation, resiliency, and arts, culture, and placemaking. Um, and we had our first phase one meeting on January 27th, and we had somewhere between about 40 and 60 people that participated in that meeting. Um, prior to the meeting, we had done a bunch of different blasts uh, through the community webpage. Uh, we went out and delivered um, informational pieces to a bunch of different businesses where people usually congregate. Uh, we also went to institutions or religious institutions um, and fitness centers to try just places that a lot of people like to congregate. Um, and a lot of things that we heard while um, or during the presentation was that uh, people wanted more options for like walking and biking, mixed use districts, um, more affordable housing and housing types. And we actually heard that there was a really strong connection between our parks and trails and other cultural institutions as well. Um, right now we do have an opportunity to continue to participate up on the city's webpage. Um, there's a story map along with a brief survey just designed to give uh, general um, or just to get general feedback from everybody. Um, and you can go to the city's website or www.cityofmoorhead.com slash onward moorhead. Um, and then there's a link on there to take you right to the survey. And this is where we're gonna be posting other updates, um, other opportunities for community engagement as well. Right now we're kind of looking at um, the next opportunity for engagement is gonna be sometime in April. Um, I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet. And I don't know if our, um, Stant our partners at Stantec have come up with a um, our, uh, activity for us to do yet. Um, but then we're also looking at doing something in July and possibly December later this year. Um, and yeah, with that, if you have any other questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Excellent. Um, thank you, Forrest. Does, does anyone have any Further questions or comments? I, 
would like to just add that it, if um, anybody has available time, it would be really great if folks could participate in some of these planning sessions. It's a great way to get your voice heard. Um, they're easier than you think. If we can do this, we can uh, participate virtually. We're hoping things open up come summer, um, but it, um, we'll continue to send information out to the park board on how to continue to participate. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Forrest. We appreciate your time and, and the update here. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. We've got um, the last thing on our, on our agenda is just the general information update. There uh, is a lot of information in the packet. I don't believe we're going to necessarily go through all of it. Um, but uh, was there anything in particular that you wanted to bring up, Holly? Nope, um, just, that's just information um, to keep everybody informed, kind of the pieces of what our fee schedule looks like in case you get asked, capital improvements, um, just so that everybody knows come May. I've got a long list of requests again from different people. Um, come May, we'll be looking at prioritizing some of those with the park board. Our May meeting works on the budget for 2021. I know we're just getting this information to you on 2020, but, or excuse me, 2021, but we will be working on 2022 and finalizing some stuff come May. Yeah, it's a little different this year since we weren't meeting at the time. You know, we didn't have our May 2020 meeting, right? Is when we usually would have went over the 2021. That, that's when we agree to it, but um, the council approves it in December. Sure, sure. So. Okay. These these aren't final until now, pretty much. Perfect. Uh, so unless anyone has any questions on any of the information that was in the packet, give everyone a chance if they have anything. Then, uh, then we'll move on to adjourn. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. I shall move. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Thanks, you too. Thanks. Good night.